I am Sarah Davila. I lead partnerships and events at CodeFresh, and we're all about bringing together users of Argo, Argo CD, workflows, rollouts, events, and all things GitOps. And so I'm joined today um, by um, Savine. He's the co-founder and CTO of Outer Bounds, and he's, his team there is building a modern ML stack that is accelerating the impact of data science. Uh, previously, this is really cool. He was at Netflix and he was building um, an open sourced Metaflow, a full stack framework for data scientists. So he's got an amazing talk for you today. We're gonna talk about the human friendly production ready data science stack with Metaflow and Argo workflow. So um, Savine, I'm not gonna steal any more of your thunder. Please take it away. Thanks, um, thanks, thanks for having me. And um, in today's talk, I'll essentially sort of like, you know, discuss some of my learnings over the past very many years, um, building and operating machine learning infrastructure. So those of you who have been sort of like, you know, knee deep in building systems, uh, whether it's for like data engineers, data scientists, or other software engineers, hopefully there will be sort of like, you know, uh, some key takeaways from today's conversation. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I'll sort of like keep an eye out uh, on the chat. Uh, if there are any questions that I can help address, then I'll sort of like take those on immediately. Otherwise, sort of like towards the end as well, I'll make sure that we have sufficient time to have a lively discussion. So um, before before I sort of like, you know, get started with the talk, let me give you sort of like, you know, a brief overview of myself. So um, for the last one year, I've been working um, on a startup, uh, so we are essentially building a machine learning platform uh, for businesses of all shapes and sizes. And before that, I was at uh, LinkedIn and Netflix, uh, basically building their ML platform. And uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, the problems that my team was sort of like thinking about and resolving was how do we sort of like ensure that uh, all of this great data science talent uh, that LinkedIn and Netflix had employed uh, we could essentially ensure that uh, their productivity uh, was high and they were able to essentially focus on their key skill set, which was uh, squarely around data science and deliver value to the business and not really have to worry about uh, the engineering underpinnings. And as part of that, we are essentially building many uh, systems and uh, one such system uh, was Metaflow, which was sort of like an end-to-end -end machine learning framework that we ended up open sourcing uh, in the uh, winter of 2019. Uh, so in this talk, let me sort of like, you know, just walk you through sort of like what was uh, our key hypothesis uh, with this project, how we went about sort of like building it. And uh, of course, you know, the title of the talk mentions Argo workflows. So how, how do we sort of like, you know, think about workflow orchestrators? Where do they fit in when it comes to uh, machine learning? Uh, there were some references to GitOps as well uh, in the description. How do we sort of like, you know, think about CICD for machine learning workflows as well? Um, and then hopefully, you know, like we can sort of like uh, chat a bit about sort of like, you know, your experiences, what you are seeing uh, in the community as well as as part of your day to day work uh, and then go from there. So as, as part of sort of like uh, my charter at Netflix and previous places of employment, we were sort of like, you know, curiously uh, trying to sort of like figure out how, how do we sort of like help these data scientists who are tasked with solving uh, some of these really high impact business problems. So, you know, take, take, let's take the example of Netflix, right? We had a team of data scientists who are thinking about, let's say, you know, solving a problem around like, let's say, you know, recommendations, right? Uh, so you have um, a team of data scientists who are sort of like constantly looking at different data sets uh, and they are trying to sort of like, you know, figure out that, okay, uh, for a given user at any given point in time, what is the most appropriate set of recommendations uh, that we can deliver to them so that there's a higher probability that they'll click on one of these titles and then they will watch it. Uh, so that they don't sort of like churn away uh, from the service. Uh, but then it wasn't only uh, problems related recommendations that Netflix was uh, essentially solving, right? Now, before Netflix can recommend you any piece of content to watch, uh, Netflix by itself has to make a decision what content uh, should even be present on the service. So, you know, like of all the pieces of content that already exists or that can be produced, can we sort of like, like somehow identify what is that high impact content? What is that piece of content that has a high degree uh, of success of making sure that uh, you know people continue to sort of like keep on uh, 
uh, paying Netflix um, a monthly subscription and keep on sort of like, you know, coming back uh, to the service over and over again. So how do we sort of like, you know, find those pieces of IP uh, once we have identified that? How do we sort of like optimize uh, the production schedule, uh, ensure that, you know, all of these um, really human intensive uh, TV and movie productions, they run on schedule and we are able to sort of like leverage uh, uh, economies of scale. Uh, how do we uh, deal with sort of like predicting customer churn? How do we deal with uh, fighting fraud on our service? Uh, you can imagine sort of like, you know, any large organization, this is not even unique to Netflix, any large organization would have many, many different business processes uh, that they would sort of like then start um, investing in machine learning to make substantial gains uh, towards that. Uh, you know, most organizations, they get to sort of like, you know, 80% good processes up very quickly, but then as organizations become mature, then they have to sort of like, you know, rely on many of these machine learning techniques to sort of like eke out uh, the next business advantage. So, so over a longer period of time, you would see sort of like, you know, more and more organizations start to sort of like invest in a very diverse uh, set of use cases. Uh, but then the big problem that comes about with these diverse set of use cases is, of course, you know, like the individuals who are solving these problems, they come from diverse backgrounds as well. You, you'll have people who are sort of like, you know, uh, more into the throes of uh, econometrics versus people sort of like, you know, practice more of classical machine learning. There are many uh, problems which may not even be sort of like, you know, squarely in the realm of ML per se, but maybe sort of like, you know, something like, uh, let's say some sort of like optimization uh, problem or some kind of like analysis or TV test analysis that's uh, sort of like somebody is tasked with. And then the goal becomes that, okay, in a large organization, what is that common infrastructure that you provision for these users uh, so that they can essentially uniquely focus on their skill set, the value that they are bringing to the table, and they don't get bogged down by the engineering details day in and day out. Now, if, if you think about sort of like all of these machine learning problems, right, like they, they all need data of some sorts, right? Um, if it's sort of like a recommendation problem, then you are essentially dealing with some sort of like, you know, tabular data set, some, um, okay, people are able to see my screen. All right, good, sorry. Um, so, so it, it could very well be the case that, you know, maybe you're relying on some sort of like, you know, tabular data set, maybe you're fighting uh, churn, uh, you're trying to sort of like predict uh, if a user is at a risk of canceling their subscription or not, so you have access to sort of like all their prior uh, streaming history or their sort of like prior interactions with your service, or some, some sort of metrics may be available. Maybe you're sort of like, you know, tasked with some kind of like NLP problem and your data set is essentially a huge corpus of text or maybe you're focused on some computer vision problem and you're dealing with sort of like images or video assets day in and day out. Uh, but by and large, uh, more and more sort of like, you know, data scientists care about sort of like accessing the data sets that they are interested in and accessing those in a more uh, quick and efficient way possible. Now, all of these projects, they also sort of like, you know, need um, a lot of compute. Uh, many of uh, these problems would require uh, data processing at scale. So maybe, you know, like you may be dealing with sort of like, you know, these images or these raw video assets that may well be in petabytes uh, or maybe sort of like, you know, you want to slice and dice your uh, tables, your metrics to do some sort of like feature engineering. And more often than not, you would need sort of like really high powered uh, compute instances. Uh, now, thanks to sort of like, you know, uh, Computer orchestrators like Kubernetes and like you know, AWS Batch and Azure and Google Cloud Services and whatnot, uh, people now have access to sort of like significant compute uh, in a relatively straightforward manner. So then, sort of like you know, a goal becomes that okay, how can we sort of like uh, ensure that uh, all of these compute primitives are also available to data scientists in a very reasonable manner? Now, one thing to note here is that these data scientists. Um, they are very technical, but from a machine learning or a data science point of view, um, not, not necessarily from a software engineering standpoint. So many of these primitives that may well be designed for a software engineer as an end user persona may not really work well uh, for a data scientist. And then sort of like, you know, goal becomes that, okay, how, how can we sort of like, you know, leverage the power of the cloud uh, in a way such that it does justice uh, to a data scientist skills and capabilities. Uh, now, now the other sort of like, you know, good thing about uh, sort of like, you know, access to this um, 
cloud scale is that then, then people can become sort of like, you know, rather crafty about how they want to uh, align their projects, how they want to sort of like think about any of their machine learning workflows. And at the end of the day, anything that these data scientists are doing, it can be thought about as some, some sort of a rudimentary workflow. So maybe, you know, like the first step is that, okay, can I get access to my data set? And the next step would be that, okay, let me process my data set and generate these features uh, out of this data set. And then after that, maybe I want to train one model. Maybe I want to train a bunch of different models. Maybe I want to generate embeddings out of that. And then I want to make a decision out of that model. Maybe I'm just storing that model so that it can be picked up by some other process and that model can be hosted or some scores can be generated out of that model. But then if let's say, you know, you ask the data scientist to sort of like draw a diagram of what is it that they really want to achieve, they'll essentially sort of like, you know, draw these circles and sort of like, you know, these uh, edges between these circles. So some, some form of workflow is ultimately sort of like, you know, what these data scientists, uh, they essentially want to sort of like um, create at the end of the day. And of course, you know, there are many workflow orchestrators, there's Argo workflows, there's Airflow, there's uh, step functions, and then sort of like, you know, new age workflow orchestrators like Baxter, Prefect, Flight, and whatnot. Um, and they provide you some way of running sort of like these workflows once de uh, defined uh, in production uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but then there's sort of like an interesting question that, okay, how does a data scientist essentially go from their idea to this long running workflow at the end of the day? What, what does that process essentially look like for them? And then it may not be even just like, you know, one workflow uh, that they are running. Uh, they may have several iterations or several versions of the same workflow. Uh, maybe, you know, like uh, this one workflow was generating one specific type of model. And now you want to experiment with a different data set, or maybe you want to create a new feature, or maybe you want to swap your uh, model training framework with a different model training uh, library. Uh, so, so you may want to sort of like clone your workflow, make certain changes to that workflow, and then run both of these workflows or let's say multiple different versions of these workflows in parallel. Or maybe let's say, you know, one of your colleague wants to fork your workflow, make certain changes to that, and then they want to sort of like, you know, run it. And they ideally the expectation would be that they are able to essentially just execute these workflows without really worrying about stepping over each other's toes. Uh, so, so then how, how do people sort of like, you know, think about structuring these workflows that again sort of like, you know, becomes um, a big concern. And then of course, you know, like uh, these workflows by themselves, they are running some piece of machine learning code. And then again, this question sort of like, you know, comes uh, to the mind of a data scientist that, okay, now if let's say I want to uh, run TensorFlow on top of GPU instance, how do I even go about installing TensorFlow? Uh, how do I make sure that, you know, I have the right set of libraries um, installed and then going forward as well uh, for every subsequent execution of my workflow, I get the exact same uh, set of dependencies. And now if let's say, you know, I want to move to PyTorch now, how, how do I actually go about installing PyTorch? Uh, now, if I'm using a laptop, if let's say, you know, like most people, if they are using a Mac, uh, then the way you sort of like can install many of these dependencies could very well be different. Let's say, you know, like if you're installing these dependencies on a Linux instance, and then again, you know, like uh, depending on whether you have GPUs attached or not, again, uh, the installation process could be very different. So how, how should people sort of like, you know, think about this? And ideally you would want to come up with a solution where um, people are not really spending sort of like, you know, day in and day out sort of like thinking about all of these problems. Because if you really think about all the problems that we have discussed so far, none of them actually touch upon like, okay, how do I actually build the best performing model? How do I think about translating this business problem into a mathematical model? All of these problems are more or less sort of like in the realm of engineering uh, that many times uh, data scientists have to essentially deal with. And that essentially causes um, a huge slowdown in their productivity. Uh, and, and then the goal is that, okay, can we essentially just like take care of all of these problems on behalf of a data scientist in such a manner such that, you know, all of this complexity is truly removed uh, from uh, their day-to-day -day life. And it's not necessarily swapped with some other sort of like unintended complexity. And that was essentially the entire premise uh, for all that we were working on uh, at Netflix and now uh, at Other Bounds. So, so now let's sort of like, you know, think about how sort of like this works in practice, right? Because I mean, of course, you know, like everybody sort of like uh, agrees with the problem uh, that there is indeed sort of like, you know, something that needs to be fixed, but then um, how, how should we sort of like, you know, go about doing that? What is that mental model uh, 
And um, as we sort of like, you know, go through these steps, I'll also sort of like, you know, talk about uh, some of the broad features of Metaflow, uh, the project that we built in response to sort of like these needs. Uh, and hopefully this should give you all a nice overview of the capabilities of the project. So now in terms of uh, the project lifecycle, right? Like let's, let's start with like, you know, the baby steps, right? Uh, so usually sort of like, you know, a data scientist, they would want to sort of like uh, do some early data exploration with notebooks, right? I mean, notebooks, they're, they're sort of like, a great uh, concept uh, when sort of like, you know, you want to sort of like iterate quickly and you want to just like prototype certain ideas, right? Uh, but, but then these notebooks can very quickly uh, become messy, right? Like, and they are like, you know, there's like copious amount of um, articles and uh, debates online that talk about the pros and cons of notebooks. Uh, but then I guess, you know, like everybody sort of like agrees that unless sort of like uh, you are very heavily disciplined about how you're managing these notebooks, they can very quickly get messy. So how, how do we sort of like, you know, move away from uh, this messy nature of notebooks to sort of like, you know, the next step of like, okay, how do, I produ how do we produ productionize this notebook? So one, one key idea here would be that, okay, can we sort of like create a workflow very simply out of this notebook? So this is, this is what sort of like, you know, very simple Metaflow workflow essentially looks like at the end of the day. Uh, so you define a very simple class uh, with, uh, of flow spec, and then you define a bunch of functions. And uh, any function that you annotate with this decorator uh, step uh, becomes sort of like a node in your graph. And for every step, you can essentially, within that step, you can delineate what is the edge or what is the next node that should be executed. And in each of these functions, you can basically pretty much copy paste your cells uh, from a notebook. And that sort of like, you know, makes it easy uh, for individuals to structure um, their code as a very simple workflow. And of course, you know, like Metaflow is not the only sort of like, you know, workflow orchestrator uh, in this particular sense. There are many other um, executors as well that allow you to very simply sort of like stitch together these workflows. Uh, but then, Metaflow essentially provides you uh, some basic functionality out of the box, uh, which actually ensures that uh, taking on this pain of converting a notebook uh, into a workflow is actually sort of like, you know, uh, well worth it. Uh, so in this particular example, this is sort of like a very simple, very linear workflow. So you have just like two steps, but you can imagine you can have multiple steps and you can have branches and forking and whatnot. And to execute this workflow, you can essentially just execute this file with like Python flow.py run. And what Metaflow will do is anytime you execute a workflow um, locally um, or uh, in the cloud, it will essentially version everything. So you can essentially go back in time and every execution is associated with uh, an execution ID uh, called a run ID uh, in the Metaflow universe. And I can go back in time and I can say that, okay, well, like this particular workflow, uh, give me the execution uh, that executed, let's say, you know, six months back. And can you tell me like, you know, what was the code that executed? Uh, what was the internal state? What were all the data frames that were generated? What was the model that was generated? What was the execution environment and whatnot? And I can also sort of like use a notebook uh, to actually sort of like plot out uh, this execution and actually really sort of like, you know, uh, understand how my workflow is behaving. And this, this way, I don't really have to sort of like, you know, then think about sort of like get in many ways uh, I can, say that, okay, like this is the model that's running in production. And I have this concrete lineage of like, okay, what was this actual code that generated this model? When was this model generated? Who executed this model? What were the upstream dependencies? What was all the data uh, that flowed into uh, this model training step and whatnot? And that sort of like, you know, allows people uh, to sort of like, you know, very easily rely on this versioning, uh, the snapshotting information without actually doing anything more than sort of like copy pasting their notebook cells into this workflow format. Now, this is all good and fine. Now, you know, we have a user who earlier was running a notebook um, on their laptop, and now they have been able to convert that notebook into a very simple workflow. And every single time they execute that workflow, all of the information, all the metadata, all the internal state between different steps and whatnot, that sort of like gets captured uh, by Metaflow. And an example about sort of like, you know, what gets captured, let me sort of like just go back 
So in this line, you see sort of like, you know, have the self dot X equals this big pandas data frame. So in Metaflow, anything that you associate to self, uh, that gets stored and snapshotted by Metaflow uh, for perpetuity. So you can go back in time and I can be like, hey, um, for all the executions that have happened so far, can you give me the values of all of these Xs? And then I can sort of like, you know, plot them and understand sort of like how the behavior um, of my workflow has changed over many uh, executions and whatnot. But then there could be a scenario where, you know, like let's say this particular data frame, it stops fitting in memory in my laptop. And at that point, um, I would ideally sort of like, you know, want to get a laptop uh, with higher memory, but then it may not be sort of like, you know, practically feasible to do that. Uh, most laptops, they essentially sort of like um, uh, run out of memory after like, you know, like you can get like 32, 64 gigs of RAM. But then many times you may want to sort of like process some data sets that may require like, you know, well over hundred gigs of RAM or maybe even, even approaching terabytes of RAM. So how do we sort of like scale vertically in the most simplest form possible? And that's where, of course, you know, um, technologies like Kubernetes uh, come in, uh, are helpful. Uh, ideally, you would want to make sure that, you know, these nodes, they are able to sort of like execute on Kubernetes or let's, you know, your favorite, uh, container orchestration system and the user is able to sort of like specify that okay you know, like can you sort of like run this particular node of my workflow on an instance that has let's say you know, like 100 gigs of RAM and whatnot and Metaflow essentially makes that uh, super simple uh, and straightforward so in this particular example you can essentially just do uh, this new decorator resources and you can specify let's say you know, I need 128 gigs of RAM and then essentially what Metaflow will do is it will execute the start step on your Kubernetes cluster, uh, and it will make sure that the pod has 128 gigs of RAM. And then the end step will still sort of like, you know, continue to run uh, on the user's uh, laptop. And this way, you know, you can sort of like be uh, very efficient with your resource utilization as well. Maybe let's, you know, you have a step in between that trains a model and that needs GPU, but none of the other steps need GPU. So you can essentially just ensure that that model training step runs on GPU, which can be sort of like a super expensive instance while all the other steps, they run on sort of like, you know, much more cheaper uh, instances. And that way you can essentially spread out your cost uh, quite easily. Uh, that's, that's all good and fine. You know, like that sort of like allows you to sort of like, you know, get access to bigger and bigger uh, instance sizes uh, in the cloud. Uh, but many times, you know, you, you may want to sort of like scale out your compute horizontally. Maybe you need to sort of like uh, process a really huge data set and the entirety of that data set may still not fit into sort of like, you know, the biggest machine that's available. And you may want to then partition that data set into smaller slices and each of those slices can then potentially sort of like fit into uh, uh, some instance that's available within your Kubernetes cluster. Or maybe you want to train a model uh, for let's, you know, all the countries uh, in which uh, your service is live in. So let's, you know, in the case of Netflix, let's say if we want to train a model for every single country, then we are looking at 200 different models. And maybe, you know, like to save time, you want to sort of like um, farm out this training job uh, onto 200 individual pods. And with Metaflow, that again, sort of like, you know, becomes very simple and straightforward. So you can essentially pass in a list uh, to the self.next um, uh, function. So in this particular example, essentially what's going to happen is that this train step uh, is going to run 100 times. Uh, so for each of the element of the param step, and each of uh, those pods will have 128 gigs of RAM available to it. Uh, so very simply, you know, you can have sort of like, you know, the start step that runs on your laptop. And then let's say uh, 100 pods get created on your Kubernetes cluster. And then maybe sort of like, you know, this um, join step, uh, it then again sort of like runs on your laptop and maybe sort of like, you know, this join step, all it's doing is collecting all of these models and trying to figure out what is the best performing model and whatnot. Uh, so, so you can essentially run sort of like, you know, these really powerful uh, kind of like pseudo map reduce uh, jobs in a very simple and straightforward manner. Um, at Netflix, we had sort of like, you know, folks who would run sort of like um, these jobs where uh, they'll fan out like, you know, 10,000 to like 50,000 uh, pods uh, in sort of like, you know, very simple manner. And all they would do is sort of like just change sort of like the range here. And this, this can be sort of like, you know, any arbitrary list uh, pretty much. And all the inputs of these lists, uh, they're all sort of like, you know, they're not immediately sort of like made available inside this train step. And then the good thing is that, you know, in this particular format, uh, the user doesn't really have to concern themselves with like, okay, how, how is the data being passed around? So you could pretty much sort of like have, um, let's say a data frame that was available in the start step. 
and you can very easily access that data frame and the train step without actually worrying about like, okay, now I need to actually store this data in S3 and then in the next step, I need to somehow sort of like, you know, um, get access to this data uh, back. Uh, if you were sort of like writing idiomatic Python, then you would expect that, okay, if I have a class variable that I'm assigning anywhere, then subsequently I should be able to access that class variable. Metaflow just does that data transport behind the scenes for you. So that's all good and fine now I'm able to sort of like, you know, uh, spread out uh, this compute over many, many boxes. Uh, but even then in that particular scenario, like one important thing for machine learning use cases is that you're still able to sort of like move data from your data warehouse to these compute instances as quickly as possible. Because otherwise then you will have these super expensive compute instances lying idle, just waiting on data uh, access. So in, in this is sort of like you know one uh, very popular uh, paradigm that we have seen where uh, there are sort of like you know data engineers who would write data engineering ETLs, let's say you know that's using sort of like Spark and whatnot. Now uh, our data scientists they are able to essentially create sort of like you know these tables uh, as sort of like Spark uh, jobs, and then uh, Spark will essentially then sort of like write these Parquet. Uh, files uh, in S3. And then Metaflow essentially ships with this really high throughput uh, S3 client that provides you, you know, close to like 10 Gbps, even upwards of 10 Gbps of throughput uh, between S3 uh, and the compute instance. And many times it can actually be um, more performant uh, than reading from the local disk attached to that instance. And that means that now you can essentially sort of like, you know, uh, run these really massive workloads where you're not really bottlenecked uh, on data throughput. So now we essentially, you know, have this user who is still sort of like running this workflow on their laptop and parts of the workflow are running on the Kubernetes cluster and they are able to sort of like access uh, this massive uh, data from uh, the data warehouse uh, rather quickly. There, there comes a time when, you know, like now you want to essentially offload this workflow execution from your laptop uh, onto some um, workflow orchestrator, right? And at that point, sort of like, you know, these workflow orchestrators like Airflow, like step functions, like Argo workflows come in handy. So we would essentially ideally want the user to be able to just sort of like, you know, like the user right now with Metaflow, they have essentially already defined a workflow. Right, so uh, you have sort of like, you know, these nodes and you have all of these edges and the user has defined its compute and whatnot. So Metaflow can essentially take this workflow and it can compile it down to let's say, you know, Argo workflows or step functions and even more recently Airflow. So now as an end user, as a data scientist, you are completely insulated from all the concepts of Kubernetes or the SDK that Argo workflows has. And you essentially now get the best of both worlds. You get all the functionality of Metaflow, like from Metaflow's point of view, this is still sort of like a Metaflow flow. You get all the features around versioning, data transport, uh, reproducibility, reliability, and whatnot. And then of course, you know, at the end of the day, you also get all the features, all the functionality of our workflows as well. Many organizations, they may already be using our workflows for their data engineering needs or other software engineering needs. And all of a sudden now you can essentially take your Metaflow flows and run them, deploy them on top of uh, your uh, Argo workflows installation. So if let's say a pager duty configured or alerting configured, then your Metaflow workflows can essentially sort of like take advantage um, of all of that infrastructure uh, right out of the box. And then of course, you know, like now if let's say your organization, if let's say today you are using, for example, Airflow, you can use Metaflow's integration with Airflow to run all your Metaflow flows um, as sort of like scheduled DAGs. And then if let's say um, a few quarters down the road, if you decide to migrate away from Airflow onto Argo workflows and whatnot, the user code remains exactly the same. So you don't really have to sort of like um, bother your users uh, to essentially go back in time and redo their work just because the infrastructure decided to evolve over a period of time. So, so now we are at a spot where, you know, like the user was able to sort of like uh, prototype rather quickly on a larger set of data from their laptop. And now they are able to essentially run their workloads um, uh, on a scheduled manner on top of let's say, you know, Argo workflows. Uh, and this workflow now, let's imagine, you know, like it's running every few hours or let's say every single night as and when new data sort of like shows up. Then the next thing that sort of like, you know, uh, is really important is that, okay, how do I freeze the dependencies, right? Like, um, and definitely sort of like, you know, most uh, organizations, they essentially ensure that uh, data in their data warehouses remains uh, immutable. Uh, 
uh, now, uh, thanks to Metaflow's capabilities around uh, data versioning and code versioning, your uh, code is also sort of like snapshotted and you don't have to sort of like rely on any sort of like specific integration with Git or something to sort of like, you know, worry about like, okay, is it the same code that's executing and whatnot. Uh, but then it's still sort of like, you know, important uh, for folks to sort of like be able to define like, okay, here is, let's say, you know, uh, the version of TensorFlow that I need to use. And then how do we make sure that that version of TensorFlow is frozen in time, not just that version of TensorFlow, but all the transitive dependencies, because one of the big issues with machine learning workflows um, is that uh, many of the failures are silent failures. Things don't fail loudly. It would be just that, you know, your um, inferences are just a little bit off. And those are really, really difficult to triage. So uh, the best idea in this scenario is that, okay, can you sort of like just freeze the entire execution environment? And we ship sort of like, you know, this integration with Conda. Uh, so the user can essentially just like specify like, okay, like for example, in this particular scenario, I want this particular version of TensorFlow and maybe I want a specific version of Python as well. And then what we'll do is we'll essentially sort of like snapshot the entire execution environment on behalf of the user and make sure that the exact same environment is made available uh, going forward in time. So even if, let's say, for some reason, Google decides to yank away TensorFlow or some of the transitive dependencies move, uh, the user is still sort of like guaranteed the exact same uh, execution environment. And they don't have to really think about like, okay, now what if the step starts running on a GPU? Now, should I actually really care about like, okay, are the correct set of drivers and all the system packages installed or not? And Metaflow will essentially take care of all of that complexity behind the scenes uh, for you. So now, now we are at an spot where you know uh, an end user is able to sort of like now run this workflow uh, rather reliably uh, but then as i mentioned before right like it's not going to be sort of like rather just a single uh, workflow uh, many times you may have different versions of the model maybe you know you want to a b test uh, different models but before you can a b test those different models you need to create uh, different models so how do you sort of like you know go about deploying these sort of like isolated chain of workflows like, you know, imagine sort of like I have one workflow that's training a model and then I have another workflow that takes that trained model and generates some scores. And now I want, let's say, you know, there's a new data scientist who joins my team. They should be able to then take two of these workflows or multiple of these workflows and clone and run uh, those workflows within sort of like, you know, their isolated logical namespace and make sure that, okay, any models that they are generating they don't essentially step over uh, any of the work that let's you know I was doing, uh, for example. So any data artifact, any object uh, that is produced by Metaflow, everything is automatically spaced. And then you can essentially control uh, these namespaces as well with these concepts of projects and branches. So you can essentially have a collection of workflows in a given project and then you can essentially carve out different branches uh, of these projects as well. And that allows people to sort of like, you know, uh, be rather independent uh, in terms of how they want to sort of like uh, structure their work and provide just a higher degree of uh, sort of like uh, isolation between sort of like different people. So now, of course, okay, now, now we have essentially, you know, uh, not only a single machine learning model, but mach multiple machine learning models running uh, in production and sort of like, you know, delivering some value. Uh, so that, that sounds great. Uh, but definitely, you know, like uh, things, things are going to fail for a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe let's say, you know, the data that you were uh, consuming, that suddenly sort of like shifted uh, and sort of like exposed certain bugs uh, in your code. Uh, maybe the infrastructure failed uh, in certain scenario, or maybe there were some, sort of some cases that, you know, you just like didn't really sort of like uh, take care of it in your code. Uh, keep in mind, we have already sort of like isolated many other uh, different failure scenarios. Uh, we already sort of like, you know, ensure that, uh, for example, the execution environment isn't really going to change uh, beneath your feet. So at least that's like one less thing to worry about. So when, when things fail, it's really important to sort of like, you know, provide a good debugging experience, right? Because many of these things, they can be um, very sensitive from an SLA point of view. So you would ideally want people to be able to sort of like reproduce that failure scenario as quickly as possible. Uh, and then be able to fix that so that then sort of like, you know, uh, a fixed version of your workflow can be pushed out to production as quickly as possible and things can be resumed. Now, definitely, you know, like within Metaflow, we provide like many primitives, like, you know, retrying failures and catching certain sort of like expected exceptions and whatnot. 
Uh, so, so you want to handle these failures gracefully whenever it's possible. Uh, but then there are many scenarios where um, it may just not be feasible to catch all possible exceptions and sort of like, you know, retry uh, failures. And in those particular scenarios, what we would ideally want is that you're able to reproduce the same failure uh, locally on your laptop. Now, the good thing with Metaflow is that every internal state is uh, checkpointed for you, uh, which means that you can essentially go back in time and resume compute of any workflow. So it could very well be that, you know, let's say one of my coworkers, they were running a workflow and that failed uh, at a given step then I'm able to essentially uh, fork their workflow and start executing their workflow from basically wherever uh, that workflow failed. And that allows me to sort of like, you know, very quickly help out my colleague uh, in terms of sort of like any failures that they may have encountered. And the same sort of like, you know, applies for work, uh, workflows that were essentially running on uh, the production workflow orchestrator as well, right? Let's say you had an Argo workflow uh, that was deployed through Metaflow and that failed midway. Uh, then essentially what I can do is I can essentially just run that job locally from my laptop, maybe even run it on a Kubernetes cluster with dash dash with Kubernetes so that that pod, act, like that job actually runs as a pod. And then I should be able to very reliably recreate that failure scenario and fix it and gain confidence that actually my fix works. And then I can again push it back to uh, Argo workflows and then it can sort of like resume compute from there. So, yeah, so uh, basically the TLDR of this entire talk is that uh, the part to production is uh, incremental and iterative. Uh, you would notice that uh, not every single uh, project needs to actually go through all of these different steps. It could very well be the case that maybe you are training a very simple and straightforward model and it never ne even needs to touch Kubernetes or Argo workflows. Uh, maybe the, uh, it's a model that is trained very infrequently and there's no desire to even sort of like schedule execution of that uh, machine learning workflow on top of Argo workflows. Maybe you may never have need for running uh, A-B tests either, uh, but it's, it's good to sort of like, you know, uh, take into account that uh, no two machine learning workflows, no two machine learning projects are alike and they'll use sort of like, you know, one or many of these features. But then what's really important is that, um, is, is the tooling, is the infrastructure actually enabling the user? Is it working with them uh, given sort of like uh, their skill sets and allowing them to focus unequivocally on the machine learning side of the house and not necessarily on the engineering side of the house? Um, so, so yeah, as, as I pointed before, you know, there, there could be sort of like, you know, certain projects where you may want to sort of like, you know, scale them to the entire data set. Maybe let's say, you know, you figured out that the way you have been thinking about modeling that problem isn't really as promising. So maybe you never sort of like even get to uh, a complete scale out. Um, and the, the big sort of like, you know, theme here is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, data scientists time is a lot more valuable than machine time. And it's, it's really, really important to sort of like, you know, think about building these solutions from a data scientist point of view, uh, because otherwise um, you would expect sort of like a data scientist to struggle with a lot of these uh, really well thought through engineering uh, tooling, but still sort of like, you know, something that doesn't necessarily work well uh, for them. Uh, at the end of the day, you would want to ensure that your data scientist is spending 80% of their time thinking about machine learning problems and not 80% of their time thinking about engineering problems. And then of course, you know, uh, the thing that's sort of like, you know, the most important for us is that uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheels. Definitely uh, the community has done a great job uh, in terms of building really well thought out um, infrastructure pieces uh, when it comes to let's say, you know, data warehouses, compute platforms and workflow orchestrators and whatnot. And with Metaflow, the goal is that can we essentially sort of like build a UX layer uh, around these uh, different stacks of uh, machine learning infrastructure uh, so that users uh, don't really need to worry about um, these foundational blocks. I'm yet to sort of like, you know, meet a data scientist uh, who is sort of like, who really cares about like, okay, like where is my instance coming from? Is it coming from Kubernetes or is it sort of like, you know, hidden in somebody's closet as long as they get access to the amount of compute that they need as quickly as possible. So yeah, that was all about Metaflow, a very, very high level overview um, and sort of like, you know, how we think about uh, Metaflow vis-a-vis -vis Kubernetes and the Argo Workflows community.
Um, if, if this sounds interesting uh, and is something that you would like to use within your organization or if you have some feedback for us, I would definitely sort of like, you know, appreciate if you could join our community Slack uh, and engage with us. But I'm happy to sort of like take on uh, any questions. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. There it looks like there's two questions in the chat. I'm not sure if we've addressed them with the presentation, so I'll call them out for you. What do you think? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so for running multiple computers, would Ray actually be better? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. So, so there are multiple different compute paradigms. Uh, Ray is one, uh, Dask is yet another. Um, and Metaflow can essentially sort of like, you know, work with uh, any of these. Uh, the compute paradigm that we have currently enabled is sort of like, you know, this embarrassingly parallel jobs, uh, which happens to constitute a bulk of use cases. And uh, in that particular scenario, having sort of like, you know, this extra uh, layer of indirection um, may not sort of like, you know, yield uh, many advantages. Uh, of course, one area where we have been sort of like, you know, considering looking at sort of like many of these tools uh, is, let's say, uh, enabling uh, hyperparameter optimization uh, within Metaflow. So that, that could be sort of like, you know, one area where, let's say, some other much more bespoke uh, compute orchestrator may come in handy. But by and large, uh, much of our needs have been sort of like easily addressed by Kubernetes so far. Awesome. And, uh, we do we do have uh, integrations not only with Kubernetes but um, with uh, AWS Batch uh, as well. Looks like we've got some more questions coming in. So um, the next one is: Where's the data of the code and the data version snapshots? Where are those stored? Yeah, good good question. So um, there there are two places in which sort of like you know Metaflow can store uh, all this uh, data artifacts. So if, if you're not integrating with the cloud, then all of this information is stored on your laptop uh, in a folder. Uh, otherwise, you can also integrate with S3 and Metaflow will essentially store all of this information in S3 uh, for you. Now, all the information that's stored either in S3 or sort of like, you know, on your local file system, uh, we compress that and we store it in a content address manner. Uh, so as to not sort of like, you know, blow up uh, your storage space. So there's only one copy of uh, data that's stored across sort of like all executions of your workflow. And that sort of like, you know, ensures that we are essentially being very cost efficient uh, with, as far as your storage bill is concerned. That's great. So it looks like we have one last question um, mm -hmm. and then a shout out uh, from Brett about how great the presentation was and that he's running a couple of meetups in the, uh, in the Salt Lake area. But the last question we have right now is, can you speak to incorporating Metaflow in a mature project using Argo workflows? You know, can it be incrementally added to an existing project without rebuilding just a really yeah. large chunk? What are yeah, your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, um, excellent, excellent question. Uh, definitely, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's where sort of like many of our users uh, start out, where they'll already have uh, some project that is already sort of like you know humming along good and well, and then they'll sort of like start migrating parts of um, that project uh, onto Metaflow. Um, I mean, that was pretty much the story at Netflix as well when we started building Metaflow. Uh, there, there were like many other sort of like tools that other teams had built. Um, and then the way they sort of like migrated was sort of like taking some uh, components uh, of their existing project. So you can imagine sort of like, you know, let's say if you have some feature engineering work um, that you need to sort of like, you know, scale out or sort of like provide better guarantees, um, then uh, people would sort of like move uh, that first onto uh, Metaflow or let's say, you know, if let's say the big bottleneck is how to get access to sort of like, you know, GPUs and whatnot, uh, then folks sort of like move that uh, model training component uh, onto Metaflow as well. So, so it completely depends on uh, the actual project and uh, what is sort of like, you know, the urgency as well as the need uh, driving that migration to Metaflow. Awesome. All right. I think that is all for questions today. Um, from a Next Steps perspective, we want to thank you for your time. That was amazing. Um, I'll be sharing a recording of this presentation and putting it into the meetup channels, respectively, from where you came from. Um, and then we would invite you to join us next month. We're doing one live from Tel Aviv uh, with an organization called Open uh, Iron Source. So um, much more to come. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thanks, Savine, for presenting. That was amazing. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Bye, y'all.